Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about hyperkalemia. This is a high concentration of potassium in the serum. Okay, this is a very, very wide differential. Just like in the hypokalemia video, I am not going to go into the treatment for each of the causes. What I want you to get an understanding of is, okay, we have a lab that came back uh, and the patient has an elevated potassium. What are What is the differential and how can I go about figuring out what the most likely cause is? And then in my other videos, I talk about, um, you know, and they're scattered all over the place, but I talk about each of these causes. So if you're interested in learning more about the management of each of these causes, uh, then uh, it, it would be good to go back and watch those videos uh, particularly. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications each and every time I put a new video up. All right, so I went over this in the hypokalemia video, but the normal range for potassium is about three and a half to five and a half, very tightly regulated. Um, the symptoms of potassium imbalance are very nonspecific, and as a matter of fact, the symptoms of hypokalemia and of hyperkalemia are very, very, very similar, if not the same. The most common thing you'll run into is weakness. <laughs> What's the differential for weakness? It's probably 50 pages long. So uh, usually you're going to detect this on a basic metabolic profile, and then from there you can um, do your workup. Uh, so the most important labs, of course, a BMP. You won't know if you have a hypo or hyperkalemia without it. Uh, you should also have a serum, magnesium, and calcium. Get an EKG if they do have hyper or hyperkalemia, but it's even more important for hyperkalemia. And then urine electrolytes and creatinine, because we want to know, are they losing or are they inappropriately um, not losing potassium through their urine? Now, here's some hints for you. You always want, so this is for hyperkalemia. I did a similar one for hypokalemia in the previous video. You always want to look at their medication history. ACE inhibitors are a huge offender. They're very, very commonly prescribed drugs, and they can cause a hyperkalemia. Beta blockers, a little bit less common. Statins, they can cause rhabdomyolysis, so that's important to know. NSAIDs, they inhibit prostaglandins, and that can uh, directly lead to a hyperkalemia. Bulimia. Potassium sparing diuretics for obvious reasons. Acetazolamide can cause a metabolic acidosis that can lead to hyperkalemia. And there's some others. Okay, so what if we have a hyperkalemia and the patient's hypotensive and hyponatremic? Then you want to think of Addison's. Addison's is going to uh, is, is going to reserve potassium, preserve potassium in the blood at the expense of sodium. So you're going to have fluid loss and uh, you'll hold on to potassium. So that's um, one possibility. If the patient's diabetic, altered mental status, hyperglycemia, think of DKA. Remember though, in DKA, the total potassium stores are actually low. So you've gotta keep an eye on when you start giving them insulin. Um, we are very concerned about the possibility of precipitating a hypokalemia. So you have to be very, very careful of running those serum potassium levels um, frequently. If they have a recent history of seizures, muscle injury, or statin use, think of rhabdomyolysis. If the respiratory rate is elevated, think of the possibility of a metabolic acidosis. Um, the ones that cause hyperkalemia are uh, type 4 renal tubular acidosis. That would be in a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, and then the various causes of anion gap metabolic acidosis. If the BUN or creatinine are elevated, consider renal failure. Remember, we take in much more potassium than we need. The kidneys are responsible for getting rid of the excess. If the, if the kidneys aren't working, then you're going to have excess potassium in the blood. If the patient has cancer and they're on chemotherapy, consider tumor lysis syndrome. Here's a diagnostic approach for hyperkalemia. This could be useful to you. So one big cause of hyperkalemia is salt replacement. So there, uh, we, we often recommend patients who are hypertensive to cut down their sodium intake. While there are actually salt replacements, 
that have potassium instead of sodium, and you get the same effect, the salty taste, but now you're just taking in a ton of potassium. Well, if you have a patient with any kind of underlying renal insufficiency, even very, very mild, that potassium can overwhelm the kidney's ability to excrete it, and thus you would get a hyperkalemia. This is very common in real life, uh, but it's probably a little too obvious for the USMLE, but I would remember this for your practice. Now, in acidosis, what's happening here is that that acid is going to be pulled into the cells, and in exchange, potassium is going to be kicked out into the serum, and so that causes a hyperkalemia. This almost always presents as a metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis, if it's very mild, may not give any symptoms at all. If it's severe, look for things like, um, like Kussmaul breathing or just uh, tachypnea. Um, you're lowering your PCO2 to try to compensate. Consider all of your causes of metabolic acidosis. Look at the anion gap. That will really help you. If you have an elevated anion gap, look for your mud piles causes. I talk about that in the metabolic acidosis video. If you have a normal anion gap with hyperkalemia, type 4 renal tubular acidosis. That's the only RTA that'll do it. Renal failure. Remember, like I said, the kidneys are our only way of getting rid of excess potassium. So if you have renal failure, it's going to impair that. Look for a patient with a history of renal disease or things that may predispose them to renal disease. Remember, the, the two most common causes of chronic kidney disease are hypertension and diabetes, which are very common. On labs, look for elevated creatinine and BUN. If a patient has hyperkalemia, and they have EKG changes, you really should send them off for dialysis if they have renal insufficiency. Potassium sparing diuretics are um, not terribly frequently given, um, but remember that these diuretics uh, work uh, a little bit differently from the loop and thiazide diuretics. These preserve potassium as opposed to wasting potassium like the other diuretics. Um, but these drugs, as an adverse effect, can cause hyperkalemia. So look for a patient who has just started amylaride, triamterene, or spironolactone, or potassium-sparing diuretics. Spironolactone is occasionally given as a treatment for virilization. Um, they may be given as a treatment for acne, uh, for hirsutism in women um, that have that. Um, if this is, in fact, the case, then you need to discontinue the drug. Hypoaldosteronism causes uh, increased sodium loss and increased potassium reabsorption. So think of this as just the complete opposite of hyperaldosteronism, which is going to cause a hypokalemia. Uh, so these patients will have metabolic acidosis and hypotension, and that's due to poor fluid reabsorption. They're losing sodium, and anywhere sodium goes, water follows. Um, so these patients will be hypotensive with a metabolic acidosis and a hyperkalemia. What are the causes? Well, Addison's disease is a potential cause. You'll have low levels of aldosterone due to an autoimmune attack on the adrenals. Uh, hyperpigmentation is very common here because we increase ACTH to uh, try to get the adrenals working. ACTH, the precursor for that, is also a precursor for melanocyte-stimulating hormone, causes the hyperpigmentation. 21-hydroxylase deficiency is one of the more common causes of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Look for a very young patient, hypotensive, salt craving, ambiguous genitalia, because all of those, uh, those cholesterol-derived hormones will get shunted into sex hormones. Uh, hyporenanemic hypoaldosteronism, look for a patient who is a diabetic who also has renal failure. And there are a lot of other causes of hypoaldosteronism, but these are the three um, that you're most likely to run into on your exam. Rhabdomyolysis is a big deal. Um, I have a video on this, uh, but uh, so I'm not going to go into treatment, but this is caused by a breakdown of muscle. There's a number of things that can do this, a crush injury, excess exercise, statins, seizures, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, number of causes. You should know those. Uh, this is life-threatening because this hyperkalemia can be quite profound, can precipitate an arrhythmia, and they can die. Uh, 
Uh, for diagnosis here, if you suspect rhabdo based on the patient's history, get a urine dipstick. It'll show myoglobin in the urine. Uh, that will, uh, it'll look like they have blood in the urine, but if you were to do microscopy, you would not see red blood cells in the urine because this is myoglobin, not hemoglobin. Uh, serum creatinine kinase will be elevated. That is an enzyme found in muscle. Make sure and get an EKG. Once you've done that, then you can start treating the rhabdo itself. This is an EKG showing hyperkalemia. So um, generally with these, uh, with these limb leads, we don't want the T-wave amplitude to be more than two big boxes. And as you can see here, um, you're about to here, um, you are to. Um, so um, this right here is where it's pretty obvious. So you have a T wave there that's about uh, three and a half big boxes. So look for uh, heightened T wave amplitude that is consistent with EKG changes due to hyperkalemia. So to manage these patients, provide the patient is stable. If they have hyperkalemia, make sure to get an EKG. If the EKG is abnormal or they have rhabdomyolysis, give calcium chloride to stabilize the heart. That will prevent dysrhythmia. And then further workup just depends on the suspected cause. Like if you're suspecting rhabdo, make sure and get a creatine kinase, for instance. Discontinue any offending drug, like if you had the patient on a potassium-sparing diuretic. Emergent management, if the potassium is more than six and a half or they have EKG changes, you're going to give the calcium gluconate, then insulin and D50. So basically what we're doing here is we're giving insulin, it'll pull potassium and glucose into the cells, but you got to make sure you're giving D50 because we don't want to precipitate a hypoglycemia. You will do that really quickly if you give insulin to a patient who's normal glycemic. Nebulized albuterol can be useful as well. Um, dialysis is also an option. That should be considered in patients with renal failure. Um, then there's also excretory therapy. This would be non-emergent management. So you can use loop diuretics and fluids. You can use k -exalate. Um, That binds potassium in the gut. And then there are others. Make sure these patients are on continuous cardiac monitoring if they have severe hyperkalemia. Low potassium diet would be recommended to all these patients until their potassium normalizes uh, or if they have renal failure and then check their potassium levels every two to four hours while they're admitted and receiving treatment.